I mean, we've had a lot of great seminars uh, during my tenure here at the CAC every year. Yeah. And to me, the CAC as is myself, I'm honored and privileged to be able to host this seminar. Because this man here is one of the greatest world champions in the history of our sport. And I'm going to I'm going to get I'm going to let uh, CAC radio co-host Jim Valley to give him a the introduction that he deserves. But really, Dory Funk Jr. needs no introduction. And I want to thank him for coming here and joining us at this year's Dory Funk. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just take a second. Turn to each for showing up and uh, being a part of it. Thank you. Without any further ado, the co-host of CAC's Cauliflower Alley Club radio program who's going to sit here and chat and moderate when we discuss Dory Funk's life story and whatever else he wants to share with you, Mr. Jim Valley. James. So, uh, this is an amazing time. It's the 50th anniversary, February 19, 1969, when Dory Funk Jr. beat Gene Kaninsky to win the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. So what an honor to be here during the 50th celebration. And Dory went on to hold the title for over four years. Today it's a big deal when someone holds on to a championship for one year. And he held it for four. The only person who held that world title longer continuously than this man was Luthez. Being second to Luthez, that ain't bad. <laughs> so we won't talk about all the stories, we'll have time for your questions, but I wanted to start uh, something earlier this year, actually February 19th of uh, 2019. I was lucky enough to be in Tokyo, Japan at uh, Sumo Palace, and they held the Giant Baba 20th Anniversary Celebration. 20th Anniversary. As a matter of fact, for Wrestle Kingdom weekend at a department store, um, the Baba family had many artifacts set up, the old World Cup, uh, the Triple Crown Championships. And uh, on February 20th, they had people from New Japan and Big Japan and they had every legend you could imagine. Onita made an appearance. All the New Japan guys and all Japan guys who were huge stars in the 90s were there. And in the middle of the card, and I should also mention Antonio Inoki was there. And the guy who got the biggest reaction that night when he came out, everybody was chanting his name, Dory Funk Jr. With, with that night, and just kind of what that night was like, maybe talk about Abdullah, you know, you're one of his greatest rivals, yeah? And maybe talk about uh, Baba as well. We'll talk about that night in Tokyo, then talk about some history with Baba and Abdullah. That night in Tokyo, Japan, was the first time in many, many years that I came face to face to Abdullah the Butcher and was not fighting him. And it's not, easy. it's not hard to see Abdul the Butcher when you walk in dressing room. <laughs> when I came in the dressing room, the first thing I did is I took, took the scare of Abdul the Butcher to really the truth. And everybody in the dressing room didn't know whether we were going to fight, shake hands, call each other's names, kick at each other. <laughs> so I walked right up to him, nose to nose, this far away. And I reached down and shook his hand. And everybody, everybody relaxed. <laughs> but I had spent my career in Japan on the other, on the other side of that view of the bullshit. My brother, Myself, the sheep and Abdul and the butcher, that was the combination that uh, we did. So many capacity crowds in Japan 
for those matches. And each and every, each and every match, thankful to myself, my brother, Abdullah the Butcher, the Sheik, or whoever his partner may have been, we had some really great matches. And uh, it was kind of legendary over there. And Giant Baba was, it was his 20th anniversary of his passing. It's different in Japan. Uh, it's a celebratory day, the day of your passing, whether it's 10th anniversary, 20th anniversary, 5th anniversary, but it was Baba's 20th anniversary. And uh, we saw many of his family and uh, felt privileged to be able to honor Jane Baba and Andrew the Witcher at the same time on the same day. So in preparation for this, I was talking with my podcast partner, Fumi Saito, who is a Japanese wrestling genius. And he talked about, did you want to beat Scout if you like? Okay. I might give that job. Oh, that's fine. I'm just looking for reasons why I don't have to stand. <laughs> so uh, he talked about how almost immediately after you won the title, you were in Japan very quickly defending the NWA championship. Yes, very quickly. Uh, my first trip to Japan, um, well, okay. It couldn't have been three or four months afterward. Yeah. And I faced uh, China Baba and Antonio Minoki on the same trip. And um, the Inoki match was one of the most famous matches ever in Japan. And there was a uh, one hour time limit. We wrestled each other for a full one hour to a draw. And it was kind of a landmark, trademark match for Japan. And I have so much respect for Baba and Inoki. And for both of them, if you consider the athleticism of Giant Papa uh, coming from baseball. Uh, he was a great baseball player to professional wrestling and able to adapt to what we do in professional wrestling. And also consider his size. He was a phenomenon. And the same is true for Antonio Inoki. And they were like black and white, different. You know, he had one style and Papa had another style. And we even, my brother and myself used to wrestle Papa and Inoki. And it was crazy. Because those two guys had to be equal. <laughs> there be people playing across the dressing room and all. What are you going to do? With Antonio and Elke, and then they would leave and somebody else would come over and say, what are you going to do for Giant Papa? <laughs> and we had to, had to keep those two guys, uh, had to take care of both of them, keep them equal in the match. And that was in itself quite a challenge. But they were both, in their own way, fabulous athletes. Didn't you have a... Uh Eventually, like, were you part of uh, the All Japan office? Did, did you book foreigners? Did, what was your role? Well, did you have a role behind the scenes at All Japan as well? Originally, that was my father. Tori Funk Sr. was booker for All Japan Pro Wrestling. And when my father passed away, um, it was kind of Japanese tradition. There was no question was it myself or Terry that would replace my father. It was me because I was the older brother. Uh, with that in mind, you also have to understand, even though I was the older brother, 
the one that they put forward as the hooker of all Japan. I also relied heavily on wrestling knowledge and skill that my brother and in the truth worked together for all Japan for wrestling. Uh, one more thing, um, at the uh, MAMA exhibit that they had, uh, they had all three of the original Triple Crown titles, one of which is on your, your t-shirt there. They also had a gift, a belt buckle, like a big, like a rodeo style belt buckle, and we were able to talk to a gentleman there, and that was a gift from you to Giant Baba. Do you remember that? A belt buckle? Okay, I'll find a picture of it. We'll talk about it later. No big deal. Um, so let's talk, since it's the NWA anniversary, let's talk about the uh, build-up. When did you find out that you were going to be the NWA champion? And I'm curious, uh, who supported you as champion? Who were the promoters that voted for you as champion? Well, I found out I was going to be the NWA champion, Dead, dead right for sure. When I had the spinning toe hold on GD and this game tapped out. Yeah. Yeah. What else can I say? Yeah. 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 How grueling was the schedule? The schedule was unbelievable. It was, well, the term, the territories. It was the, the era of the territories. There were 30 territories in the United States. Uh, also Mexico, Japan, Puerto Rico. And as NWA world champion, it was my duty to travel from territory to territory and defend the NWA World Championship belt. I never stayed in one place more than one week. And cities like St. Louis, San Francisco, Houston, uh, St. Petersburg, the really big shows, I would often travel for one match, go one way, and then come back to another territory. Uh, those, those were huge towns in the territories that they represented. Uh, it was an unbelievably heavy schedule. And I would sometimes, because of, of the schedule, Arrive in the city and have like <laughs> 45 minutes to get down to the, to the wrestling arena and sometimes actually walk in and say, Who am I working with tonight? Because <laughs> you know? there was so much, so much change, so much travel. And that happened in Tennessee one time. Uh, one time when I walked in the dressing room and it was like uh, like 30 minutes late. And I walked in the dressing room and I said, well, who am I working with tonight? <coughs> and the guys in the dressing room said, uh, you're working with a whitey over there. And I looked over there and there was somebody named Whitey Caldwell. Anybody know the man? Yeah, and I looked at Whitey and he didn't weigh 170 pounds. <laughs> and I thought, well, these guys in the dressing room, they're, they're ripping me. They're joking me. And so I figured, well, I can play with these guys. I'll just sit here and wait to see who I'm working with. And came time to go in the room. I went down up. <laughs> Got ready to go. Walked in the ring and out of the restroom. Here came Whitey Cowell. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So, uh, about the NWA World Champion, things there's a champion is supposed to accomplish. Uh, Whitey Cowell and myself were one hell of a match. And I was able to return 
back to Nashville and go on the ring and draw a second house with Mike Cole. And there's a lot to be learned about being an NWA champion. Because the idea is every time out, create an opponent that you can come back with. And that's the difficult part about being a champion. You've got to induce the wrestling fans to come back to the next show. <laughs> so, uh, it was a challenge. And as time went on, and he wrestled more and more as champion, I got better and better at achieving the challenge. And had some huge success in cities like Houston with Wahoo McDaniel, Johnny Valentine, uh, Florida, uh, the Florida Territory with Jack Briscoe, St. Louis with Jerry Briscoe, all over, all over the world for that matter eventually with Jack Briscoe. I wrestled him more than any opponent ever. And every time I went in the ring, the whole purpose was to bring the people back the next time. And Jack was a as you all know, he was a super athlete, a great amateur wrestler. Uh, he was filled with credibility. And that's what I needed to be able to work with one way or another with people who had credibility and could see who they become in the WA World Champion. Because that's what I know. <laughs> the people want to see the, the, the title change hands. That's what, that's what they want. What about, uh, I, I grew up in Portland, what about working for Don Owen? Well, I've got to give Don Owen credit, he was the best payoff man in the wrestling business ever. Really? He was. Yeah, as a, as a, on, a, on a percentage basis, and uh, his city, Portland, wasn't that, that huge, that big of a draw. But Don was the fairest man of them all. And other places, I mean, that made much more money. But Don was straight up. The NWA World Champion, supposed to get 10% that way. Then he asked you what your trans was. <laughs> Everybody asked you what your trans is, and then they did that. that. <laughs> but but uh, Don was straight up. He was the best. Different territories had different wrestling styles. How did you adapt? I kept my own style. Uh, I was going to build a match around who's going to win the match. It, it wasn't going to be about who could beat somebody else up. Uh, and you beat them until they bleed to death. <laughs> um, it wasn't about how high you can fly, although, although I do respect the guys that do all the flying off the top rope and things like that. But in most cases, when I walked in the rain, Especially with guys like Briscoe, Robin, and Valentine, Billy Robinson, Les Thornton, out of the Calgary territory, um, Freddie Blassie in San Francisco. It was, it was all about, and we always built the match around who's going to win the match. And that's one thing that we don't see too often, but it was the key to huge box office returns for the uh, wrestling shows. Uh, I'm sure people have a lot of questions, but there's something I wanted to touch on. Uh, right now, there's a series of documentaries that are being shown on a, 
on a website and they're getting quite a bit of traction and one of them is on the Von Erich family. You obviously were uh, very close and somewhat of a mentor to David Von Erich. That was something maybe you could talk about, maybe some of the work in Florida, when David, uh, you kind of took David under your wing. I had a love with David Von Erich. He was extremely talented, had the charisma to get the job done, he was big enough and tough enough to walk over who he had to walk over to get there. Uh, David Von Erich had his father's attitude, <laughs> which is, I'm the biggest, toughest son of a man in the world. And he didn't say something to him, he said, son of a young. But that was Prince's attitude. And that was uh, David Von Erich's attitude. And he, David was my partner. Anything I would ask of him, he would do. He was, uh, he grew up in professional wrestling. And he grew up and went in the right part of professional wrestling so that he understood uh, promotion, box office appeal, and he had it. David, David just had charisma. And his father had it, but David had it in a more likable way. <laughs> it was terrific to work with, though. What about how uh, he was able to be so dislikable in Florida? Well, he was from Texas and bragging about it. His daddy was the best in the world and he told everybody. <laughs> He's just ready, I mean, he, he could rave on about it. But it, it, it was based on how he felt. It was truly coming out of David's heart when he was saying it. And he understood that uh, to draw money, yeah, he understood that we had to be the bad guys. <laughs> Facing the Bristol Brothers, what the heck? <laughs> so, but uh, David was a, a, a true friend and very, very sad to lose him. Was that Florida run a test to see how he could be as an NWA champion? That, you know, early when I was champion, they might have been looking for a new champion. But as time went on, and the appeal at the box office as NWA World Champion is how you judge. And business was good everywhere. Uh, and I don't say this to try to be regulatory, but as NWA Champion I had at the time, I drew more money for the National Wrestling Alliance in professional wrestling than anybody else. And if that being the case, nobody was looking for uh, or pushing for a new champion. Business was good. And we all had a good time with it. The promoters, myself, everybody. It was a fabulous time for the wrestling business. Let's do questions. Go ahead, Franklin. Thank you. My question, Dory, is this past October, the NWA celebrated its 70th anniversary. That being said, did you ever think in your wildest imagination that to this very day, you and your brother Terry still remain the only brothers in history to hold the NWA World Heavyweight Championship? With all the, all the news out about NWA and with the publicity being put out by William Carden, Dave Rihanna, and with the sad success of their champion right now, um, nothing surprises me. 
Um, I think they're doing a great job. Nick Aldis is a fabulous champion. He's got a great company with a great name and a great history behind him. They're doing good business, and that's the criteria that we always consider a world champion, a promotion, an individual, or a, you know, a regional champion. The consideration is what's their box office appeal. And NWA has just recently proven itself to be able to draw the big houses and put on a great show. Thanks to Nick Aldis, Dave Redown, and William Corbin. And they're going to be a very serious force in the very near future. And they're super entertaining, too. <laughs> they, are, they haven't forgotten the entertainment value of professional wrestling. And don't ever think that I didn't understand the entertainment value of professional wrestling. It's just how do you present it to capture the imagination of the people in the wrestling fans. Mike, do you have a question? Yes, please. I've got two, but I'll ask them one at a time really quickly. Dory, you had quite the history, you and your family in my home base territory in Los Angeles in the 60s and 70s, and in fact, the three of you guys coming in on two successive cards, you defending the title against Moscaris and Fred Blassie, turned the tide and helped feed, defeat the promotional battle against Vern Gagne over at the Forum, the fabulous Forum of Jack Kent. Right. What memories might you have of the Los Angeles territory, battles with the Sheik, Moscaris? Mavia, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rocky Johnson. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Masters. Uh, Peter Mavia. He, uh, I wrestled him for one hour in Los Angeles. And I was a stiff and sore son of a gun coming out of there. He was crazy. <laughs> and then my second is your dad is such a beloved, absolute beloved figure, humanitarian, promoter, everything, athlete. Do you have some maybe uh, ribs or roasters or anything on your dad to show a different side we might not be aware of? Dory Funk Sr. Well, uh, for me, he was very strict. <laughs> Just for me. He never said. This is not where you go. He never, he never complimented me because excellence was, expe excellence was expected. And uh, if he did say anything to me about a wrestling match, it was to correct me. And I went through my early career trying to please him. But when the match was over in Tampa, Florida, with Gene Canisti, and my father was in my home, uh, and my hand was raised, and I had the NWA World Championship match, he came over and put his arm around me and just told me, he says, I just want to tell you, you've done one hell of a job. And that meant so much to me and my friend because I came up a, a, a different way. Excellence was expected. And uh, when, he, when he complimented me, I just, well, I nearly broke up. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but that's the system I, I, I was raised in. Thank you. I want to, uh, real quick, we questions. Um, Fidel Sierra is here, and he worked in Florida with you. Yeah. Talk to us about uh, working with George Jr. Oh, I had to. 
great time and great matches with Dory. Uh, my first time there, we were like in a six-man on Florida Championship Wrestling, and it was Dory, Buzz Sawyer, and I want to say Tommy Gilbert, but I'm not positive. Very, very likely. And me. Tommy, Tommy was one of my favorites. Me, Coco Samoa, and I can't. And Dory, they ended up anyway. It was the uh, 15 minutes. Everybody was gone, and then it was just me and Junior. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it was the first, one of the thing, only times that Florida Champion Wrestling had one match on, and it was that. And by the time that match is over, Junior, you know, I got so much respect for the whole Funk family. And Junior made me bust my ass in that ring to try to get over as a Latin wrestler in the state of Florida. And it was very hard matches, but he always tried to teach me the best. And I could never, ever lose that respect for Dory, Terry, and God bless your dad, but Eddie Graham and your dad were like, <laughs> they what a mind. Thank you so much. All the respect is mutual because I, I can't do it by myself. It can't be done that way. So it takes um, mutual respect for the person that you're in the ring with and also it takes the knowledge of what his style is. And how, it's not about so much what can you do for yourself. It's, what can you do for your opponent? Uh, it's what can you do for the wrestling fans, for them to be entertained. <laughs> it's always comes down to what can you do for the promotion? Because <laughs> they, they got to make money. <laughs> so, but uh, there's nothing like professional wrestling for a case of mutual respect to accomplish things. And that's what we had. Fidel made a great point about um, your dad and Eddie Graham. And your dad really kind of mentored Eddie Graham. Talk about the whole <coughs> Graham-Funk relationship connection going up to you and everything in Florida. <coughs> Eddie Graham came to Amarillo first, before he came, he came to Florida. I, would, I wouldn't, couldn't be for sure on what the dates were, but Eddie Graham came to Florida, to Amarillo, and watched my father, and learned from him, and watched the programming of wrestling and how he built the matches. He studied everything my father did. Then Eddie Graham went to Florida and there was a promoter, Cowboy Luttrell, who was having some difficulty in attracting uh, crowds enough to pay the expenses of the promotion. And my father always felt that professional wrestling to be success had to share in their glory. My father always made sure that the Amarillo, the Amarillo, Texas, the wrestling, contributed to, contributed to a place called Texas Boys Ranch. They gave 10% of the gate to Texas Boys Ranch. And Graham carried that same principle when he came to Tampa, Florida. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed that Eddie Graham and the Tampa Wrestling was given 10% of the gate to Florida Sheriff's Sports Ranch. And so it's not all, it's not all what you can do, but do for yourself. It's what you can do for the good of the community, for other people for wrestling fans or 
for kids that need help. And um, it's not all just go take everything and count your money. <laughs> uh, it really comes down to what can you get in anything that you do. I remember in the early to mid 90s when the internet was still in its infancy, you had one of the first websites of a wrestler, so you were way ahead of the curve on that. Could you tell way back then kind of how the internet was going to change? How wrestling is today. I was just intrigued by the internet. <laughs> it was. And I kind of did a catch as catch can, learn what you can, and do what you can. I did not go to computer school or anything like that. I hustled my own website. <laughs> I had a good time doing it, and, I, and I've uh, made some mistakes with it. But uh, I've tried to keep everything really credible on there. It's a large website with loads and loads of information on professional wrestling. And someday, and I, I always hope it's sooner than later, I intend to write a book. And it would basically be uh, based on content that's currently on my website right now. And uh, I haven't started one of them. Well, I have, I have started on the book. <laughs> and it's, um, it's on paper, but not yet for sale. <laughs> Yeah, in the back. Hey, uh, yes. I want you, you, Terry, are the only ones to hold the world titles, but also you've lost both of these losses to Harley Race. Talk about Harley Race. Yeah. Harley Race learned the hard way. Professional wrestling. And uh, by the time he came to, yeah, I, I think Harley Race again. Learned a lot from my father, Dwight Funk Sr., wrestling in the Amarillo Territory. But Harley was as tough as they come. He uh, evidently had a car wreck. <laughs> he broke his arm, and they put a steel plate in his arm. <laughs> so uh, he didn't mess with Harley Race. Otherwise, you know, you can catch a form on the side of the head. It's, it's not an iron, it's a steel plate. It's like a hammer. Um, speaking of people um, that have gone through Amarillo, uh, that you've worked with, there's a guy right there, Stan Hansen. Um, talk about uh, Stan Hansen. He's awesome. <laughs> and not only that, he knows how to what we say, get himself over. Oh, yeah. And he's also, uh, some wrestlers work a very stiff side that if they had no box office appeal, they wouldn't get away with it. But Stan Hansen is a box office attraction. His partner, Bruiser Brody, Bruiser Brody. Those two guys are really tough guys. And they're not easy to stay in the ring for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, or whatever, and stay with them. They go at a high speed, they work stiff, <laughs> if Stan's going to throw a clothesline at you, you better be ready for you to get your head off. <laughs> so, um, there are a couple of guys that get themselves over when they, they go to a territory, whether it's Japan or whether it's here in the United States. If they go as a team, they're big and strong. 
and you can count on them to make the people that live with those two are tough guys. And they, they really are in real life. Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody. Yeah, I guess we haven't covered Brody. We should talk about Bruiser Brody. So much respect for him as a wrestler. In Japan, uh, Puerto Rico, um, it was an odd story. And so many things are still unknown about Bruce Brody's death and how he died and what happened. And we're looking right into the face of cover up. Um, and we, I hated to lose Bruce or Brody because he was somebody I knew if I was going to go in the ring with him, we were going to have a hell of a match. It was going to tear the house down, and it would be good for return the next week, and the next week, and the next. We were wrestled together in tag team combinations in Japan for many years. I don't know how many, but it was the Japanese fans, the wrestling fans, are very critical. They won't accept poor work, or lazy work, or uh, laying on your butt. <laughs> they're, they're very uh, critical fans. And Bruce McCrubbly and Stan Hansen, my brother, myself, we all had to work hard to gain and earn the respect of the Japanese wrestling fans. They're real, real critical. But if they back you up, you can count on them. They're going to be there and they're going to be with you forever. That's the other side. You mentioned the respect of the Japanese fans. Um, and it's, in 1981, the, uh, the first retirement Talk about what a, I mean, that was huge. That was an incredibly emotional night and a legendary night in Japanese wrestling. That was my brother's return. Yeah. Yes, his first return. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's kind of. I of course, he had a second return. I think he had one today, right? <laughs> um, I know it's, it is. Well, I mean, in regard to my brother, he was. He was wild and crazy. Uh, he was a maniac. Uh, he was a heel. He was a bad guy. He was a good guy. Uh, people liked him. If they liked him, if they disliked him, they were violent about it. But uh, I'm not sure what to expect out of him in the future because he's going through a very tough time. I, don't know how many know, but uh, he would have been here, but he uh, lost his wife like uh, six weeks ago or so. So we don't, we don't know what to uh, expect out of my brother. How would you compare and contrast the way you were NWA champion and the way he was NWA champion? <laughs> you're, you're, the way you guys both went about it. <laughs> well, that's it. We, we both go about a different wrestling style. He's the wild and crazy, fight through the crowd, hit you with a chair, uh, barbed wire, blood, guts, <laughs> whatever. And two brothers, same family, you can't, you can't be the same. So I built my career around wrestling and interest in wrestling. Uh, strangely enough, you can get every bit as much out of a good wrestling match as you can 
have a table sliders and chairs match. And if it really can be done, it does take a lot of skill, and it does take strong personalities on the part of each wrestler. Uh, both draw. Violence draws. <laughs> draws like crazy, right? But at the same time, I could go on a ring with Jack Briscoe and walk to the middle of the ring and he put one of his arm drags on me and, and the people just pop. They, they would just go crazy. But they knew there was more coming, uh, especially with Jack and myself and uh, Jerry and myself. <laughs> well, who made Daniel? Everybody used to complain that he, his chops were too hard. He was too rough. But the only thing about Wahoo is if you were, if you were in the ring with him, you knew you were going to make a good pay, payday. And the same was true of uh, Johnny Valentine. Uh, you knew if you were going to work with John. It's going to be a good day day. And those guys figured out how to do it without tables, ladders, and chairs. And to some extent, I figured it out myself. And, and I had been in a few wild and crazy death match, barbed wire match, blood match. But they're few and far between in my case. But uh, it was kind of my brother's character to sell violence and to go that road. And I think it worked out better for both of us because it gave us each a separate style and separate personality that we could bring to the public. Any question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, before your family ran in, it was run by Doc Sarpolis. Yes. Uh, how was Amarillo wrestling presented differently than compared to when you're, did you guys make any changes in the presentation or did you pretty much continue the same style that was, that Doc Sarko was promoting? And what can you tell us about Doc Sarko? Doc Sarko was, <laughs> I can tell you that finally used to go meet with the promoter, Doc Sarko <laughs> he, uh, before he'd go to, go to his house in Amarillo, Texas, he'd take me and my uh, brother and drive us off at a movie, and we'd watch a movie three times, and then he'd come, come and pick us up. But Dr. Polis goes back a long time. Uh, I don't really know much about his ideas on promotion. I know that. Uh, When my father demonstrated that he could draw money in Amarillo, Texas, he got a lot more leeway and freedom on what he did from Doc Sarpolis. So the transition from the Doc Sarpolis area, era to my father, Dwayne Funk Sr., was a smooth transition. It wasn't it wasn't a case of somebody stealing the territory. Yes. Uh, one more Texas figure. You mentioned Eddie Graham and your father, someone who was a big influence on both of them, is Cal Farley. What can you tell us about Cal Farley and how he influenced, um, I guess, two important figures of psychology on wrestling? Well, Cal Farley was the owner of Texas Boys Ranch. And as, as I understand it, the hundred kids out there, and Boys Ranch really, they called it a home for underprivileged kids. In truth, it was a place where they took kids that were headed for jail and they'd rather give them a try at Boys Ranch and see how it worked out. It wasn't really a home for just 
underprivileged kids. And the superintendent at that time couldn't control the kids. So California contacted my father and asked him if he would give a try at being superintendent of Texas Boys Ranch. He did, and the first place he took the kids, and they were up to 16 and 17 years old, but the first place he took them was to the uh, wrestling match, to the wrestling mat. <laughs> Show them all who was boss. <laughs> and that's what the other president did. Those are some deep cuts. That's really <laughs> impressive. Okay, one more question. Yeah, sure. Uh, you mentioned, of course, Brody and Stan Hansen. Those are just two people that came from West Texas State. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you developed your relationship with West Texas State and how you kind of turned the football program into a wrestling recruitment? <laughs> Google it if you guys have, there's tons of wrestlers that came out of the West Texas Bay. Yeah. I, I think that it was the influence of my father, Tony Punxin, and the, the, the knowledge of who he was through me. I played football for West Texas State University, and we're fortunate enough to go down to the Sun Bowl and El Paso and be at Ohio University. We also beat Bowling Green in that year, and we considered ourselves uh, the unofficial champions of the Mid-American Conference. Because we figured Bowling Green and Ohio University were the, the two best up there. Um, the, ch the change from Football to professional wrestling again because things were very different then. Uh, Mickey Mantle's salary the year I graduated from college was $16,000 a year. And available in professional wrestling was there was just more money available. So uh, I made a choice. As soon as the Sun Bowl was over, in fact, I signed a contract with uh, Doc Sarpolis and on the radio rails of a PWA Super Constellation when we got back to the Amarillo Airport from El Paso in the Sun Bowl. Once I got started, it was Amarillo Territory, seven days a week, wrestling, traveling. <laughs> I never looked back. And really, this thing gave me a way to take care of my family. And that was the most important thing Amen. at the time. So, I never gave a look back to football after I got started. You recruited so many in the DiBiase and the uh, Tito Santana came through there. Dick Murdoch tells people that he did. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, Dick, Dick Murdoch used to go to the sidelines and, and oh, I know what Pitt Murdoch did, he's the only one in history. He played defense in the West Texas A&M uh, spring practice game. <laughs> he, was, he was out there making tackles and telling people off. <laughs> he, was, he never went past high school. <laughs> What about uh, Ted DiBiase? Ted DiBiase was the son of... Uh, okay. Mike yeah, probably the closest friend of my father was Mike DiBiase. Um, I was in Australia and my father called and uh, told me that Mike DiBiase had passed away. And it was the one and only time in my life I ever heard my father cry. So they, they were very, very close. Ted uh, Bibiase went through West Texas State University, played football, turned pro wrestler, and did one hell of a job. 
But it was, it was his calling. And then he became famous. He became a million dollar man. <laughs> uh, he went off to WWE and made a fortune. Uh, he truly is probably a million dollar man now. <laughs> but, uh, Ted was, uh, he was a great actor. Did a great job. Hello, Mike. Um, you guys trained a number of people, your entire family, uh, one of which Ray Kajika, that was from the 90s, still Who? working to this day, as Jim knows, and uh, Jumbo. Can you tell us uh, about them a little bit? Yeah, he was a uh, great basketball player in Japan. But he was an amateur wrestler in Japan, too. And he came to Amarillo, Texas. But I had the opportunity to work out with him first in Japan. He came to Amarillo, such a super athlete, that the wrestling business wasn't a difficult thing for him to pick up. He was a natural athlete, and he was the natural, nicest guy in the world that you ever want to meet. Uh, he did a terrific job for us there in Amarillo. He was almost immediately accepted by the Amarillo wrestling fans. And he stayed with us for, I think, the better part of two years. And maybe longer, I don't know. But I went back to Japan with him as his partner, and uh, he, he was just the kind of guy that he put his whole heart into every wrestling match. He would always count on him. You know, you mentioned Jumbo when he worked Amarillo. You know, he didn't do the stereotypical Asian World War II stereotype. <laughs> He was, he, was, he, he was my partner. He was, yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a good guy. Which was rare for the time. Yes, I got, I got to admit that was rare. But they, they, it was so acceptable to the wrestling fans in Amarillo. Yeah, no, he never did the. Anyway, question. Uh, do you have any stories of Sonny Myers? Sonny Myers. He went, did he wind up in Kansas City? Yes, sir. I thought so. I really can't say. St. Joe's. Yeah. St. Joe's. Yeah. St. Joe, Missouri. He became the sheriff. <laughs> he got impeached. He got impeached. He got impeached. Only only sheriff ever got impeached in the world. <laughs> they uh, they opened up when they were building the interstates. They gave them a budget for trees to be planted on the exits. Yeah. Sonny bid it out to his son-in-law and then opened a tree farm. <laughs> just, just business. Just business. <laughs> Ron, you got something? Yeah, I do. Dory, how many tours have you made of, J of Japan and how many times do you estimate you've been around the world? Because your, your travels are amazing mm -hmm. at a time where traveling was tough. Something over 80 tri trips to Japan. 88 trips to Japan? And how many times around the world? I know you've worked Australia, New Zealand, 80 times to Japan. And well, I, I haven't gone all the way around the world once. Not oh, yet. You have not? <laughs> <laughs> In terms of mileage, I'm talking I've lived about. in Nigeria, London, England, uh, the Caribbean. How many miles do you estimate that in your lifetime of traveling in this business? Hours on the road. Lifetime traveling. Hours on the road, spending Nobody cars, planes. Probably not as much as you might, might think, because so many times I was welcomed back in Japan. That became the, the trip that I always made. But uh, I've been to Nigeria, uh, London, England. Australia? Australia, I had a ball. I've been there four times. Yeah. And uh, really loved it. They love Americans over there. Uh, Do you have any Jim Barnett stories? Working in Australia. Or even here in the States. 
Well, that's the last question uh, from me. Is your part of that? <laughs> he was a real character to work for. <laughs> but he was a great promoter and probably at that time ran the best territory that you could work in. And that, that was Australia. Uh, all of the wrestlers from across the country were, 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 didn't work to Sydney or West Coast or East Coast. We worked the, the whole country the size of America, traveling across, first class travel, uh, all jet airplane. Everybody, when they got there, went downtown Sydney and there was a tailor and they made uh, mohair suits. That's what we used to get. <laughs> Go to Australia and we get a mohair suit. Uh, but he, he really ran a fabulous territory and he paid to get the guys to come over there. Uh, upper level money. Kowalski, who mentioned Kowalski earlier? I think Kowalski was getting a thousand dollars a week in 19... 50, uh, 1963, and that's wow. equivalent to 1963 to now, $1,000 is 15000 That's Yes. Okay. Jack Crystal, without knowing the city, I can't. Uh, I, I wrestled him maybe 200 times as NWA World Champion. I think that was the St. Louis. Jack Crystal in St. Louis. And we, it would have been a great match. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack was fabulous to work with. Anything in the world you wanted to do. He was in condition. He could stay up with you. Um, he could get over appeal to the wrestling fans. He had all the qualities that it uh, takes to become a world champion, and eventually he did. Um, I can't say enough good about Jack. You could do anything you wanted with him. He was a complete worker. We talked a lot about your in-ring. Talk a little bit about uh, outside the ring, kind of being the matchmaker, and kind of running things for uh, Jim Crockett in the, uh, the early 80s before Dusty took over. Oh, that's busy. That's, a... that's what I mean. Booking a territory and working a territory at the same time is unbelievable. Because every single night you've got to book a card for the next show, and every single night you've got to perform on the card. And I did this in, in Florida, North Carolina, Amarillo Territory. But it, it becomes all encompassing uh, so that there's no time to sleep unless somebody else is driving and you're making a trip. It's probably not the way you really should do it. But the territories that I worked were not only getting a, a wrestler, they were getting a book or two. So maybe it was a bargain for them. But it uh, was a real pull, once again, on family life. Because you were constantly working and constantly concerned about what's going to draw next week in St. Petersburg and Tampa and uh, Jacksonville, Miami. Uh, 
and we ran more than more than seven towns a week. Florida Territory used to run about ten towns a week. Do you have a booking philosophy? That had a wrestling philosophy, and uh, this is for anybody considering getting into wrestling. It's not about what you can take, but it's about what you can give. And that's to the wrestling fans, to the, as a wrestler, to the promotion. Uh, it's all about how you can make feel, people feel good about supporting you and supporting what you do. And uh, we'd like to thank all of you right here for some really good questions. Real quick, before we wrap up, you, you're staying busy, you're still training. Yes. You still have your school. Talk briefly. Yes, yeah, talk, 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 talk to Marty. Where'd she go? Marty. There's Marty. Marty. And the website is? Pardon me? The website is? Joy-Funk.com. You guys get that? Yeah. You can type in Joy-Funk and Google Explorer comes right up. If you know anybody that wants to be a professional wrestler, come and get in touch with us. Really, all they got to do is uh, type in Joy Funk on Yahoo, and it'll bring up our website information. You know, um, people talk about who the greatest of all time is, and it's very subjective. But when you look at the real criteria, drawing power, longevity, influence. I got him on longevity. <laughs> One of, and many would probably say, at least at the worst you can say about you, is that you are in the conversation of the greatest of all time. And we're so glad to be honoring you this year. A much well-deserved award to receive tonight at the banquet. It is my honor to be up here on the stage with you, ladies and gentlemen, Dory Fox. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.